Okay. Okay, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Can everybody hear me? If you just pop a thumbs up in the chat to let me know that you can hear me talking, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay. Hi, Don. Hi, Amy. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Sensational Sea Day. My name is Kayla, and I'm working as an education and outreach officer with Sequoia Ocean Education. And my job is very exciting because I get to learn about and see sea creatures every day. Now, today is the first day of our Science Odyssey campaign this year, and I am so excited that you can all join me in learning more about some animals that live in the Salish Sea. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to some of the marine invertebrates. So those are animals that do not have a backbone or any bones in their bodies. And there are so many amazing and unique creatures in the ocean that it would take more than an hour to see them all, let alone a quarter of them. So for today, we're just going to focus on two groups of animals. That's echinoderms and arthropods. So let's get started. Uh, first, the phylum echinodermata. So that comes from the ancient Greek origin of the word uh, echinos, which means hedgehog, and derma, which means skin. So hedgehog skin or spiny skin, those are the kind of animals we're going to be looking at first. And this phylum includes sea stars, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. So animals in this phylum have an internal car calcium carbonate skeletal system, but the size and their appearance vary widely, which you'll see. So sea stars and sea cucumbers have small plate-like or spine-like structures called ossicles, and then sea urchins and sand dollars have a fused interlocking plate system called a test. So I have here, this is a sea urchin test. You can see all the plates are fused together there. We've got a smaller one here. Okay. And then we also have this. So this is a, uh, an example of a sea star ossicle. So it's a dried out sea star there. Okay. So now I'm going to shift the camera so that you can see some of the animals that we're going to be talking about. And a kinoderm structure is also organized on the number five. So they have five rows of two feet and five arms. Um, and it's true that some sea stars have more than five arms and that we'll see some of them today. So, Another important uh, theme for today is adaptations. So we have one activity planned for you today, which is to do an animal adaptation drawing. So after you see all of the animals today, we hope that you are inspired to create your own uh, animal adaptation creature and then share it with us by emailing education at sequeria.com um, or by tagging us on Instagram. Okay, so here we go. Okay, so as I said before, echinoderms are structured using the number five. And so the first animals that we're gonna be looking at today are the sea stars from phylum echinodermata. And sea stars and other echinoderms have what's called a water vascular system. So essentially this means that they require seawater for locomotion, respiration, and transportation of food and waste through their bodies. 
And this here is what's called a leather star. Okay, so these animals are pretty common to see here on Vancouver Island. And important body features to watch out for are the mouth, which is located on the underside, and also the madreporite. So you can see clearly on this leather star here, we've got a spot, which is the madreporite, which is that spot right there. And this spot is important for the circulation of water through a sea star's body. And the sea stars use the madreporite as a valve to control how much water enters their system. So, gently flip this one over here. Okay, we can also see there are clearly five rows of tube feet on this leather star. They are smooth and slimy to the touch, unlike some other sea stars, which feel a little more spiny. And these leather stars have a wide ranging diet consisting of algae and invertebrates. So they will eat sea anemones, uh, sea cucumbers, sea urchins, swimming scallops, sponges, bryozoans, and diatoms. They are not super picky eaters. And they also have strong tube feet that they can use to pry apart the shells of their prey. Okay, and the mouth is located right in the center of the sea star. We can also see there's a scale worm currently living on this leather star. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a second. Okay. We also have a blood star. So sea stars exist in many shapes, sizes, and colors. This blood star is a nice vivid uh, red color and also has some gray patches around its central disc. Now these sea stars mainly eat sponges and biofilm. And they also usually have a commensal scale worm that lives on their bodies. So that means that the scale worm does no harm to the sea star. It just benefits from its protection. So you can see the scale worm is right on the, right on the center there. And then of course we have our six rayed star. So this is a much smaller species. It can grow up to seven centimeters in diameter, about three inches across. And it has six rays instead of the common five. Uh, these sea stars will often eat the purple volcano sponge and they camouflage really well in the intertidal zone on rocks and under boulders. And these six rayed stars are sometimes called brooding stars because the females will shelter their developing eggs under their bodies for up to three months. And during this time, they won't eat anything. Okay. Now camouflage is a very important adaptation that a lot of uh, marine invertebrates use to protect themselves. Okay, our last sea star was feeling a little bit too comfortable in our bucket, in the bucket here. So the last sea star I have for you is the giant pink star. So, okay, there we have giant pink star. Its uh, dorsal surface is a light pink color and it has small spines that form distinct lines down the five arms. So can you see 
lines forming down the arm there. Now these can typically grow from 13 to 35 inches in diameter and have been reported weighing nearly 10 pounds. So that's making them one of the largest sea stars around here. And they are opportunistic feeders and they have a diverse carnivorous diet. So they usually like to eat bivalves like the Pacific gooey duck and other clams or giant barnacles, uh, sand dollars, snails, small dungeness crabs, and of course, detritus. Now, some of you may know this already, but it always amazes me to think about how sea stars have not one, but two stomachs. So one stomach can come out of their body and it can start digesting prey like mussels uh, in their own shell. And then they use their second stomach to further digest their food. Okay, you can see we popped a mussel in there in case it wanted a snack later. Okay, so we're going to move on from sea stars and we're going to talk about sea urchins. Okay, so just give one moment here. It's so interesting doing programs from the inside of the office. Okay, so we're going to just move the sea stars over. Okay, next we have our sea urchins. So in this basin that I have here, we have a green sea urchin and a purple sea urchin. And now I know that they look spiky. Uh, however, their spines are actually really delicate. So each spine has a ball and socket joint attached to the body and it can move on its own. Um, and there are also tube feet all over that help the sea urchins move along the seafloor. So like sea stars, sea urchins have their mouth located on the bottom of their bodies, uh, but they also have five sharp teeth. And this is also referred to as Aristotle's lantern. So this here is an example of a sea urchin's jaw. And the famous philosopher Aristotle wrote that the structure resembles a horn lantern. So the lanterns he meant had five panes made out of horn uh, that protected the candle inside. So you can see there are five teeth on the center. A little bit difficult to focus. There we go. Okay. And then sea urchins also have an opening on the top of their bodies and that is actually their bum. So sometimes when we feed the urchins carrots at our lab, we'll start seeing orange uh, droplings everywhere. And we always think that's pretty funny. But in the wild, the sea urchins will eat kelp and they will crawl over the kelp and use their sharp teeth to scrape at it. And they have quite an appetite and sea urchins can actually eat their way through kelp forests if they're allowed to do so. so. Let's see if we can get a close up of the tube feet moving. might be able to see 
some of the tube feet moving in between the spines. And we will move the green one over. Purple ones are extra sticky. Okay. There we can see the tube feet moving in between the spines. Okay, and our last type of echinoderms that we're going to look at today are the sea cucumbers. So these soft bodied animals are filter feeders. The animals that we've seen so far, the sea stars are mostly carnivorous, so they eat other organisms. And then the sea urchins are herbivorous, meaning they eat mostly kelp and algae. And now we have the sea cucumbers, which are the filter feeders, and they eat dead or decaying organic matter. And they use feeding tentacles to filter feed and catch small floating particles of algae to sweep into their mouth. So sea cucumbers play an important role in marine ecosystems, similarly to what uh, earthworms do on land. So here we have a burrowing sea cucumber. This sea cucumber gets its name from the fact that it likes to burrow deep down in mud and rocky areas of the low intertidal zone. It has 10 finely branched bright orange or red feeding tentacles that extend from its mouth. You can see that it's starting to do that here on camera. And now in the wild, these tentacles are often the only visible part of the animal, uh, as the rest of its body usually remains hidden in a crevice or under rocks, and it scrunches up uh, like it's doing right now. If you look for them, um, you can sometimes find them at a really low tide, but they are tricky to spot. Then we also have a stiff footed sea cucumber. So this species is much smaller and it can only grow to be eight centimeters or three inches long. And uh, they have their tube feet in four rows around their bodies there. They're yellowish in color and non-retractable, so their tube feet are what makes them feel a little bit more stiff, um, as well as their calcareous ossicles. And another fascinating fact um, about echinoderms is that they have the ability to regenerate parts of their body. So this can come in handy for creatures like sea cucumbers who are vulnerable to predation. Um, an example is that sea cucumbers are known to eviscerate parts of their guts when they feel threatened. So evisceration is a defensive mechanism to scare or distract predators um, by ejecting their internal organs. And although the sea cucumbers can regenerate their guts in a few days, uh, evisceration is an energy intensive activity. 
Um, so they may also do this if the water quality is really poor in the area that they are in and they wanna get rid of excess waste or chemicals. This white or uh, stiff-footed sea cucumber is known to expel its guts in autumn and it grows a new set in the spring. Okay. And then we have one more um, sea cucumber here. Okay. So this orange one here is called an armored sea cucumber. And these are covered in hard calcareous plates. So they're not soft like the other sea cucumber species that we've seen. They also have red branched uh, feeding tentacles that extend from their mouth. They're just on the top of the oval shape. And then they also have a distinct row of tube feet running uh, longitudinally down the center of their underside. Although when they stick on a rock, they are really stuck on there. So unfortunately, I'm not able to show you their tube feet today. And these armored sea cucumbers also have a high concentration of saponins. Um, that's a class of chemical compound derived from plants. And they have it in their tissues, which makes them toxic to most predators. Okay. And then, let's see. Okay, I'll try to get this to focus one more time before we switch gears to arthropods. And then we'll have tons of time for questions at the end as well. So you can see that the feeding tentacles are starting to come out of the armored sea cucumber's mouth there. Although filter feeders, it's usually a very slow process. There's the feeding tentacles on the burrowing sea cucumber again. can see that the feeding tentacles are starting to sweep back in towards the mouth a little bit there. And the mouth is actually right in the center of all those feeding tentacles. So it's a little bit difficult to see. Okay. So again, please bear with me while I just switch my workstation around. Okay, so now we're going to switch gears to arthropods. So phylum arthropoda stems from the ancient Greek origin of arthron, meaning a joint, and podos, meaning foot. So these animals are in the jointed foot uh, phylum. So this phylum includes crabs, shrimp, barnacles, amphipods, and isopods, a few of which you are about to see. And phylum arthropoda also includes insects, making it the largest and most diverse phylum on the planet. 
And so animals in this phylum have jointed limbs, of course, and their body is segmented into three regions. So a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Many of the animals that we see today have the head and the thorax fused together, and therefore it's called a cephalothorax. And each um, segment also has a pair of appendages. You can see that the decorator crab is starting to move in the space in here. So arthropods also have a hard exoskeleton that needs to be molted or shed as they grow. Uh, imagine having a hard suit of armor every day and then eventually you would get pretty uncomfortable and cramped as you grow. So arthropods figured out a way to grow a second exoskeleton underneath their old one um, as they grow bigger. Okay, so. I'll just start with the decorator crab. Okay. So the decorator crab here. Um, decorator crabs have a heart-shaped or a triangular carapace, um, and they are covered in hooked setae. So those are stiff structures resembling hair or bristles. And they, the crabs use those tiny hairs to stick pieces of algae. To themselves to help them camouflage. So this decorator crab has done a pretty good job of decorating itself to blend in with its environment. And when a decorator crab moves to a new area, it will also um, decorate itself with whatever is available. So they change their decorations based on their environment. Let's see if we can get this one to focus. Okay. We can see all of the jointed legs from this angle, as well as the two pinchers at the front. Now I'm not going to pick up this crab because their long slender legs are really delicate. Oh, there we can see the mouth parts moving a little bit. So this crab usually just likes to eat uh, whatever it can find. So a little bit of algae as well as some uh, detritus or dead or decaying organic matter. Okay. And then we have a couple other crabs that are hiding in the back here. Okay. So we also have a 
little hermit crab here. So hermit crabs are sometimes called the clowns of the sea. And they have uh, 10 legs and two larger claws. Um, so there are hundreds of species of hermit crabs, and they are distinct from other crabs because they have um, a soft, a softer exoskeleton that they protect using an empty mollusk shell. And as hermit crabs grow, they of course get too big for their shells and end up needing a larger one. And hermit crabs will also carefully inspect the empty shells that they find before deciding if they want to move into that particular shell. They have specialized back legs that help secure the shell on their back. And it's kind of hard to notice with the hermit crab moving around so quickly, but they do have one uh, front claw that's larger than the other. And they use that larger claw to climb and fight and cover the opening of their shell, kind of like a door. Okay. Uh, the next crab I'm gonna try to show you is a kelp crab. Okay, so this kelp crab, it actually ended up losing some of its legs, but it's okay because it will grow its legs back when it molts its exoskeleton. And this kelp crab is actually already growing another front claw. So... We'll see. So you can see it's got um, a big claw and a tiny claw that's growing. And then that other purple crab there is a pygmy rock crab. And those crabs, they're pretty shy. They usually like to uh, take shelter in giant barnacle shells. And we'll talk about barnacles in just a little bit. So kelp crabs, um, the one that I was just showing you before that's more of a smooth olive green color. They are fairly common and can be found clinging to kelp or hiding under beds of algae and eelgrass. And they sometimes put bits of algae like the decorator crab um, on their rostrum, which is a, a small part of the carapace that sticks out near their eyes and that helps them camouflage. They also normally have large pinchers in relation to their body size that they use to defend themselves if they're picked up by any predators. And sea otters really like to eat kelp crabs. Okay, the last crab that I have to show you is called a helmet crab. I'm just going to grab it from another basin. So these are fairly new 
uh, crab to me, but this is one of the, um, a fast moving crab. This one is also needing to grow back some of its legs, unfortunately. Uh, they also use camouflage as a defense mechanism. So they frequent eelgrass and kelp beds and wire weed. And they are also covered in sete. So that's the tiny bristle like hairs that cra some crabs use to hook algae onto their bodies for camouflage. And the sete, so uh, that is a, a detail that distinguishes them from the invasive green crab. So the invasive green crab is a species that threatens other, other marine species like um, mollusks and other crabs. And sometimes people get the two confused. So they confuse helmet crabs with green crabs, but uh, green crabs have um, a smooth body. So unlike the uh, textured body here. Okay. So now I'm going to switch away from crabs. Um, they are a big part of arthropods, but there are also isopods and amphipods. Okay, so these are small arthropods that also demonstrate the segmentation and jointed legs that are a key feature of animals in this phylum. And because they are usually so small, I just have some photos to show you. So this here is a rockweed isopod. They are flat, uh, top to bottom flat like this, and they're mostly bottom dwellers, although they can swim. Um, more often they are found to be clinging tightly to um, algae. And then, whereas amphipods are more compressed um, and swim on their sides. So isopods are flat, and then amphipods are compressed, and they swim on their sides. I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, we managed to find some skeleton shrimp. So hopefully you can all see this here. So we had a red algae in one of our um, aquariums in the office, and we found a skeleton shrimp uh, clinging to the algae. And this is looking at it underneath a microscope. Um, so these skeleton shrimp uh, move by gripping with their front claw-like legs, these ones here, and they move in kind of like an inchworm fashion. So we'll just can kind of see it moving in this video here. It was moving across the algae out of the field of view. There it goes. You can see its body is also segmented there, and it has a pair of back legs that it helps it climb through algae. Okay. All right, so the last, um, the second to last arthropods that I'm gonna to talk to you about are barnacles. Did you know that barnacles are arthropods, living animals in the same family as crabs and shrimp? Okay. 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 
So, right here we have a giant barnacle. So giant barnacles, they have a bright yellow or orange uh, when they're open. You can see this one moving here a little bit. That's a giant barnacle moving around. And these barnacles can grow up to six inches in diameter and 12 inches tall. Um, and they usually grow in uh, clusters, although you can find them on their own. So barnacles, um, when they are hatched, so barnacle larvae are free swimming and they will cement their heads um, to a substrate that they find suitable uh, before building the shell around their body. So essentially barnacles live upside down. And if we could open up uh, one of these barnacle shells, we would be able to see the uh, soft body inside, including the mouth and the thorax and the segments where all of the cirri, uh, that's the feathery looking appendage that comes out of barnacles when they are feeding. Uh, we'd be able to see where those attached to the rest of the body that's inside of the shell. So we can kind of see these are um, regular acorn barnacles that you can see at a low tide when you go to the beach. And I'm hoping the camera will focus enough so that you can see the barnacles feeding, because you can see their, their Siri kind of popping out there. So after barnacles attach themselves to a substrate and they surround themselves with about six plate-like structures that they fuse together, uh, the opening at the top there we can see um, is where they feed and breathe using the Siri, the long and feathery appendages um, that sweep food into their mouth. There. Okay. So the other um, arthropod that I have today, I have a couple shrimp in this hex tank. Um, they are very fast and a little bit hard to track with the camera, but I'll just try to show you in here. So we've got one tiny shrimp moving on the bottom and then we've got another one just down there. So shrimp have a cephalothorax and an elongated abdomen. And they have a pair of walking legs as well as swimmerettes. And the swimmerettes are all the other uh, feather, more feathery looking legs that help the shrimp swim. Shrimp are more adapted to uh, swimming than walking. Okay. This one here is a little bit transparent as well. So we can see some of the um, inner portions of the shrimp, which is really neat.
And so now we have a little bit of extra time to uh, see. I brought a bonus phylum in case we had a little bit of extra time. So, so far you've seen phylum echinodermata. So that's the sea stars, sea urchins, and sea cucumbers. And you've also seen phylum arthropoda, which are the crabs and shrimp and barnacles, um, and also some isopods and amphipods. So now, I'll just bring back over the basin with the helmet crab. And the bonus phylum is Cnidaria. So we've got some sea anemones to show you. Okay. Okay, so here we have a nice uh, painted anemone. You can start to see the crown of tentacles surrounding the mouth. And now Nideria, they, their main um, adaptation that they have is that they have stinging cells that help them capture food and also defend themselves from predators. And over here, we've got some aggregating anemones. These ones are really common to see in the intertidal zone um, at a low tide. And just to refresh that the intertidal zone is the area of the beach that's covered by water during a high tide and uncovered at low tide. And a lot of these animals, they need to be well adapted to the changing conditions of the intertidal zone. They need to be able to survive out of water for periods of time, as well as in water. So just like humans have adapted to live on land, we have two legs that help us walk upright, and we have lungs that help us breathe air. Uh, these animals all have special adaptations that help them live underwater. So our idea with showing you these different animals today is that you would be inspired to brainstorm and think about um, good adaptations that help creatures be more suited to their environment. which is part of the reason why we would love for you to take what you've learned today and uh, create your own creature that's either inspired by echinoderms or by arthropods or even by the cnidaria animals here, the anemones. And think about how your creature can be best adapted to live in the environment that you choose for it. You can see the anemone is really opening up now. Okay. All right. So we've still got about 10 minutes. I'm checking the chat box here if there's any questions. 
um, or other animals that you would like to see again, then I can bring them back on camera. I know it's a little bit uh, tricky. Okay, the sea cucumber, had, both of them have their feeding tentacles out right now, so I'm going to try to bring those back on camera. Okay, we can see we got a little bit uh, spooked when I moved them, but there we have the feeding tentacles out again. Okay. My oh, my favorite echinoderm and arthropod. That is really hard. Um, I really love sea cucumbers because I think they are so neat the way that they filter feed using their feeding tentacles. Um, we do have a, another video on our YouTube channel, which includes a video of an armored sea cucumber feeding. Um, up close, so you can see the tentacles actually sweeping into the mouth, which we weren't able to see um, quite up close today. And then my favorite arthropod has to be the uh, graceful decorator crab. Um, I just love the way that they will change their decorations based on their environment. And I've actually seen decorator crabs stick uh, Sponges. So sponges are another living marine animal. Uh, I've seen decorator crabs stick sponges to themselves, which is pretty neat. And then how strong is the giant pink star? Well, they definitely have really, really strong tube feet, which is why I wasn't quite able to get it out of the bucket today. But I'll be able to show you its tube feet right now. So this giant pink star, it's also really large, but it has really strong tube feet. So those tube feet moving right now, they're really sticky. And I definitely don't want to force the animal to come off of the bucket if it's comfortable there. So I just left it, but it's always fun to watch the tube feet moving. So the tube feet help uh, sea stars move around and they help them breathe. Um, when sea stars are out of water, they can't use their tube feet properly um, because of their water vascular system. Okay, and it seems like this star wasn't quite hungry uh, for this muscle today, but maybe it will eat it later. Okay. A bit of a glare. You can also see a little bit up uh, closer now, the spines that are on the pink star here. So in between the sort of uh, slimy, soft 
uh, skin on the sea star. There are all these spines that make up the um, ossicles. And they form the distinct lines moving down each arm of the sea star. All of these, we had another question in the chat pop up. Where did all of the animals come from? So World Fisheries Trust is the um, umbrella company of which Sequoia Ocean Education is a division. And we work with Westwind Sea Lab Supplies. So they are a lab that um, has their own collection license and they go out and collect animals um, that we can use in some of our programs that we do. Okay. Are there any other questions that uh, we can answer? Or I also have my colleagues working on the chat box with you. Um, if there's any questions that I didn't get to or answers you would like to hear again, uh, just pop them in the chat. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this is the first time that I've done a YouTube live program. And it was a lot of fun. And I'm so glad that you could join me to see some of these animals um, up close and personal on camera, that is. And I look forward to uh, seeing any of the animal adaptation drawings that come in. Um, if you complete the animal adaptation drawing today, as well as um, one activity from the rest of our Science Odyssey uh, programs, you can be entered to win a prize pack from us. Uh, it's full of marine themed goodies that you can use for yourself or for your classroom. And we would just love to have you engage in Science Odyssey with us this year, even though we can't be in person. Okay. So that's all I have to say. And I'm going to I'm going to say my goodbyes now. Okay, thank you. And hopefully I'll see you tomorrow and then um, on the last two days of Science Odyssey as well. Okay. Thank you everybody.